welcome back. Um, we do still miss the water, and doing that in TreeJS is extremely easy, so we'll do that next. We'll declare the water mesh just below the hexagon meshes right here. There we go. Now let me walk you through uh, what we're doing here. We're going to use a cylinder to model the geometry of the water. And by reusing this constant, we're going to determine how high the water is going to be. So in this case, it's 20% of the maximum aid of the scene. You're probably already familiar with these properties, but what makes water special uh, for this project is the use of the transmission shader of TreeJS, which we can toggle by specifying these four properties. So by enabling transmissions and transmission and transparency in a mesh physical material, we can model materials such as glass or water, for example. And we can use some physical properties like the index of refraction to determine which kind of material we are rendering. So in this case, we're rendering water and we'll use an index of refraction of approximately 1.4. I encourage you to play with thickness and check what happens when you change this number. It's going to be fun. Let's remember that the mesh needs to receive some shadows and let's position it a little bit higher from the, um, from the floor of the scene. And then we can finally add the mesh to the scene. There we go. There's our water. It looks pretty horrible at the sides. I'm not going to explain to you why that's the case, but we don't really care because we're going to cover it with, um, with another cylinder, which is basically going to act as a container for the old scene. Um, and that will be our next step. We're going to use a cylinder again to model the walls of our scene, just like that. And you'll notice that this cylinder is just slightly bigger than the cylinder that is creating the C mesh. And it's also a little bit taller. Uh, you can play with this number again to your liking. What we probably haven't discussed yet is this new constant. So TreeJS, for performance reason, only renders the front side of an object by default. If we, if we also want to render the back side of an object, we have to specify this property. I encourage you to try this mesh with and without the side property to determine what's the difference between the two options. There we go. Next step is to add some form of floor to our scene, and we'll use another cylinder to do that. You probably have an idea already of how this works, so I'm just going to paste the code, take the time to read it, but there's nothing new in here, really. There we go, this looks super cool. We're still missing though some of the generative elements that we had in the original scene, like the trees and the small rocks uh, placed around the scene. We are also missing the clods, but we're going to start with the rocks first. So yeah, let's do that next. We need a new function, which we're going to use to make the stones. There it is. Now this function is going to take two parameters, the height at which we're going to place the stone and the position. I could have modeled this as a, as a single vector free, but I'm an idiot. So we're going to go with my bad design and just use two variables for now. The rocks will be modeled with a, sp with a sphere geometry. And with this line, we're making sure that the radius of the rock is going to be a number between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4 because this line is going to give a random number between 0 and 0 0.3 to which we're going to add 1 so the end result is going to be a radius between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4 we also want a bit of variation when we are placing these stones so instead of just using the normal position as is we are also going to create two new random variables which are going to displace a little bit the position of the rock. Now we're going to place these stones in the scene and the way we're going to do it will probably surprise you. Now remember, this function creates an hexagon geometry. So what we're going to do now is every time we're going to create an hexagon for the stones of the scene, we're going to add this line. Now let me explain what we're doing here. We're going to draw a random number between zero and one. Every time this random number is bigger than 0 0.8, we are going to spawn a stone. And the stone is going to be spawned 
in the hexagon that we are creating inside this function when it was called. So basically, if you want to make an hexagon that is a stone hexagon, then after making the geometry of the hexagon, let's draw a random number between 0 and 1, and if it's bigger than 0 0.8, let's spawn a new stone. Are we going to do that? By merging the original hexagon geometry with the new geometry returned by the stone function. And that's the result. Sometimes these little guys are going to spawn on top of the stone hexagons. Now, I also want to spawn these stones not only in hexagons that are made of stone, but also in the hexagons that are made of sand. So I'm going to basically add the same identical line here. Please notice, though, that we're not adding the stone on top of the sand geometry. We're adding this stone on top of the stone geometry, even if we are inside the if statement that is computing the sand hexagon. And as a result, we have some stones spawning in the sand hexagons as well. If you want, you can spawn these stones in all the other hexagons, especially those that are underwater, which would be cool. But for now, I'm just going to limit myself to sand and stone hexagons. All right, we're getting very close now. The next step is to add the trees. And we'll do that more or less with the same logic that we use for stone. So what we have to do in practice is to make a new function, which we're going to call tree. Let me walk you through what's happening here. We're going to use the same inputs that we're using in the stone function, and we're going to model the tree with a cylinder geometry again. But this time, the cylinder that we are going to render is going to look more like a pyramid than a cylinder. Now, how can we make a cylinder look like a pyramid? Or rather, a triangular pyramid, which is the geometry that we're going to use to render our trees. So what we have to do is to first set the number of sides of the cylinder to three. So basically, the, um, the base of this cylinder is going to look like a triangle. Also remember that these are the top and bottom radius of the cylinder. And since we want a pyramid, the top radius is going to be zero, while the bottom radius is going to be any other number that is not zero. So we're going to give 1.5 radius, in this case, to the uh, base of this pyramid. 38 is just a random number that is going to determine how tall this section of the um, of the tree is going to be. You also notice that we're going to use three different geometries, or rather three different pyramids, to model a tree. And we're, um, at the end of the function, merging all of these geometries into a single one, which is going to be returned by the function. And finally, the translation command is just going to be used to properly position each section of the tree. Okay, now we can basically reuse this function almost in the same identical way that we were using the stone function. So we can go over here, and inside this section of the makeX function, we're going to add this line. Now, same identical idea as before, but this time we are populating the grass geometry with our trees. And I'm doing that because I want to make sure that the tree has the same texture as the grass hexagons. And take a look at that. It's a simple function, but the stuff that you can generate with it, it's super stunning, I think. And I especially like the way that they cast the shadows. And also the fact that each time that you refresh the page, you can't really predict where they're going to be, which is basically the beauty of procedurally generated maps. All right, now we're missing just one last thing, which is the quads. And I hope that you don't hate me for it, but I'm just going to go over them very quickly because this video got way too long and I don't want to waste too much of your time. So there we go. This is the clods function. Clods will be modeled as spheres. And we're going to have a random number of clods. You can basically read this line over here almost as if it was just a simple number between 0 and 4. I'm elevating the random number. Uh, by 0 0.45 to slightly change the distribution of the random numbers. Basically, instead of being a linear function, it's going to be exponential, but you don't have to worry about that. You can just imagine that this is all that I'm doing here. Now, each clod is made with three spheres. The first one will be translated a little bit more to the left, 
and the last one is going to be translated a little bit more to the to the right. All of them will be translated by a random number between 0 and 0 0.3 in the uh, y direction. Then we're going to um, merge these spheres, translate them by a random amount, and randomly rotating them. This is all that I'm doing here. And notice that since I want all of the spheres to translate and rotate by the same amount, I'm going to create a new geometry first, merging um, all the spheres together, and then I'm translating and rotating this new geometry. Then I'll just make a new mesh, specifying flat shading to true to make sure that the lighting looks um, sort of pixelated. You're going to see it in a moment. And finally, we just have to call this function over there. And look at that, we have our clots. And we got to the end of the video. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this project as much as I did. I really love building procedurally generated maps. Each time you press refresh, it's a new surprise. Seriously, each time. I have a lot of exciting stuff coming up for, for this channel, so I hope that you stick around and see the next projects that we're going to build together. And I would also love to hear your thoughts and ideas, so if you have them, please post them in the comment section, because I would really love to hear your opinion on this video format. And again, I hope you guys had a great time. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.